The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello and welcome to a new season of The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, Brazil's National Museum rises from the ashes of a devastating fire for the country's bicentennial celebrations. Why is the National Portrait Gallery in London trying to raise 50 million for Joshua Reynolds' portrait of Omai, a Polynesian man celebrated in 18th century Britain? And Michael Heiser's city is finally complete. I talked to Alexander Kellner, the director of the National Museum of Brazil, about how he plans to mark Brazil's bicentennial and restore the museum in the wake of the 2018 fire. Martin Bailey tells us about the National Portrait Gallery's ambitions to acquire the portrait of Omai, arguably the greatest painting by the 18th century British artist Joshua Reynolds, despite its £50 million price tag, the latest instalment in a long-running saga regarding the painting. And the land artist Michael Heiser's work City in the Nevada desert has been finished after more than 50 years. For this episode's Work of the Week, our editor in the Americas, Ben Sutton, finds out more. Before all that, we have a new subscription offer. If you have a friend or family member who's going to study art, art history or another subject this year, why not buy them a gift student subscription to the art newspaper from just £25 per year? Visit our website, click subscriptions and select student subscription. Do also subscribe to this podcast and our sister podcast, A Brush With, wherever you're listening. Now, exactly four years ago, on the night of the 2nd of September 2018, a faulty air conditioning unit in the National Museum of Brazil caught fire. Flames spread rapidly through the 122-room building, and within two hours, the museum itself and more than 18 million pieces in its archive had been destroyed. Today, ahead of the celebrations next week, marking 200 years of Brazil's independence from Portugal, the National Museum will announce its future plans and begin to show at least some of its collection again. Alexander Kellner, the leading paleontologist who's the museum's director had been in place just six months when catastrophe struck and now has the task of rebuilding the museum and its collections. I spoke to him about the bicentennial and how the museum plans to rise from the ashes of the disaster. Alexander, it's Brazil's bicentenary. How central to the celebrations are Brazil's museums and cultural community? Well, that's a tough question to ask and even tougher to answer for a public employee in the midst of an election, presidential election (laughs) campaign. What I can tell you very, very simple is that we kind of, you know, science and culture overall expected a little bit more from our government for this really ephemeral date, you know. It, It would be really a wonderful time to reflect upon the country, what happened in the last, you know, years, to discuss the present and also to think about our future. Notwithstanding, as you all know, due to several problems, perhaps the pandemic, the war, whatever you want to use, it's not happening the way we thought. So what I can tell you is that each institution is kind of working alone. For example, the SBPC, which is the Society for Progress of Science in Brazil, they are doing a seminar discussing exactly what in the sense I'm saying. Several museums, for example, the Ipiranga Museum, which is so important for Brazilian independence, it's now reopening on, on September 7th. And our museum as well, which has a really very interesting and I would say a fundamental role to play that played uh, for Brazilian independence is also on September 2nd making press conference where we're going to essentially uh, to discuss what we're doing but also to deliver the first part of the palace reconstructed. Okay, so tell us about that first part of the reconstructed palace, because obviously you've been furiously fundraising for the past few years since the fire, which is, of course, exactly four years ago to the date that you just mentioned, 2nd September. Tell us what you can do this year to sort of show that first stage of reconstruction. Okay, we'll come back to the fundraising part. But let me just tell you, on September 2nd, the project which we call Museo Nacional Vive, the National Museum Lives, is uh, keeping its promise and delivering part of the palace rebuild. And that's the historical facade, plus 
the garden in front of it. In other words, the visitors that since September 2nd, 2018 could not go there, were impeded essentially to, to go to the palace, can now approach the facade and walk through the garden. So th okay. this is number one. Number two, as is, is very important to stress, we want our project is a very open project. So people can have access to the information, people can discuss it, and people can even provide interesting contributions. So also on this date, we will have a mineral exposition, which is inside the palace. Although people cannot go inside, they can watch the specimens, also showing that we're rebuilding our collection, plus an exhibit of uh, marble statues that once were upon the roof of the museum, which were now removed from the roof, which are now in the garden and, and which are restored. And by the way, on the roof now we, we will have replicas, so, so this material can be uh, saved. And furthermore, we will have expositions showing on one side, an exposition showing what people expect from the museum, which was organized by the Goethe Institute from Germany. And on the other side, the different phases of the museum, what we're doing, what we intend to do. So in other words, we want to reassure to the society that the project of the rebuilding the first museum founded in the country is on its way. You mentioned coming back to funding. I wanted to ask you about the funding because last year on Twitter, the Brazilian government said, we're restoring several historic buildings. And I know that the funding that they have put into the museum so far has been relatively limited. Can you confirm just exactly how much the Brazilian government has put into the restoration of your museum? Well, what I can tell you is, uh, number one, you may not believe that, but I'm writing a novel about it. I'm writing a novel about how it is to, to be the director of the museum in those last four years and another three and a half years, which I have to go until I finish my, the second mandate and then I, I retire. But when it comes to founding, actually what we really wanted is number one, yes, resources from the Brazilian government. We got a lot of resources from the deputies of Rio de Janeiro. We got uh, resources from the bank Pradesco, 50 million reais. Another 50 million reais from another bank, the BNDS, which is Development Bank of the country. And also 50 million reais from a mining company, the most important mining company we have in Brazil, which is Vale, through their cultural institute called Instituto Cultural Vale. So this, this money is asserted, these resources are, you know, have been promised to us and we're using them. Now, what we really want externally is material, object for our exhibition. Less than 24 hours after the big disaster of September 2nd, uh, 2018, the director that was talking to you said the biggest challenge that we will have, and that is not resources, and that essentially is collections, because we will not be able to have our exhibits without national, and here it comes, also international support. And this is something actually which I'm a little bit disappointed, particularly from North America, which I expected much more. But we will talk about this next year. I, I hope to be able to twist some arms in order to make this contribution happening. Even Russia is helping us. So, you know, we should try to do something with, with America as well. And here I have to stress the important partnership with UNESCO, which was in right of the beginning when we didn't even know where to look and what to think. UNESCO was with us, guiding us through this very, very difficult time, as well as Germany. The German government came and they donated one million euros, which were essential for the recovery of the material inside the palace, which was covered by the rubble. So this is also very, very important. And now we have Portugal helping us. We're discussing with Holland. We're discussing with Spain. And Austria also helped us with the donation of the first international collection that we received. And that was from the Universal Museum Ioanneum of the city of Graz.
What do you mean by international support? Do you mean works lent from other collections? Is that the way that you foresee being able to have exhibits? Or are you expecting international foundations, etc., to donate works to you? Very good. I'm expecting international foundation, but also museums to make donations of objects, of real objects for our museum. You know, Ben, here I have to tell you, and I have to be very straight with that. We in Brazil need to deserve those new objects. And we're only going to deserve them if we reconstruct the palace with the best measurements for people. And here I mean our visitors and, of course, our technicians, as well as for the new collections. And believe me or not, Ben, we are doing right that. It was very hard for us. It was very painful for us. But we learned our lessons well. But even if museums or international institutions come to us and say, you know what? When you're ready, we will donate this and that. This also helps me. I don't need the material now. And I need it in a couple of years because the museum is scheduled to reopen complete in 2027. So 25, 26 will be the years when, when we are going to need the material. But I need the commitment before that because I have to think about the exhibits. Yeah. And, and to be very honest, we have 26 um, German institutions that are doing that. They're saying, we are going to help you when you're ready. And the point is, I have to convince, we have to deserve that material. And if we don't have a good safety measurement, we're not going to get the material. We're not going to get those objects. And also, there's a political uh, aspect of this. If we have many commitments, I can go with them to my government and say, look all the nice things we can have if we do our homework. Right. One of the things that would be crucial to that is for you to prove that the reconstruction of the building fits all the safety measures, that the reconstruction of the building will be absolutely at the height of conditions that international museums expect. What can you tell us about that reconstruction and the efforts you're making to prevent anything like what happened before happening again? Here's the point. We do have a committee studying that. Because we need to have all those projects uh, being done. We now have, uh, as we pointed out, we have the project of the facade and the roofs ready. And this is what we're working right now. We just have started inside the planning of the museum inside. And we are also starting to plan uh, our new exhibits. This all goes in hand in hand. And for that uh, purpose, we are, of course, discussing the measurements of safety. As you know, different objects need different safety measurements. For some water is good, for some water is the worst thing you could do. So this, this is what we are doing right now. I wanted to know about also what your plans for the inside, for the way that you show the collection, the way that you approach the history of Brazil from this point onwards, because it's obviously terrible what happened, but also it does give you an opportunity to start again. And I wonder to what extent there will be very new ideas in the museum. For instance, the building itself has a very complex history which relates to Brazilian independence but also to dark histories of the country and was once owned by a slave owner for instance to what extent can you have very modern museological ideas in this new approach to the museum if you allow me to point it out we are in a position to even incorporate the problems that arrived with the pandemic we are in the position to make a museum, a natural history museum, that could even be a model for others and experiment with different solutions. And one thing is evident, we need to involve the visitors. We need to involve people that come to museum. And it cannot only be, you know, we hear the hair professors teaching, whatever, whatever. It has to be same way fascinating. It has to be informative, but it also has to be somewhat engaging, which, of course, are nice words to say difficult to put in practice. Now, when it comes to what we intend to have in the museum, essentially we will have four main circuits. One is the historical part. And in that historical part, as you stressed very well, some of the dark histories of Brazil with slavery, the place itself, you know, was the home of a slave owner, so we will address that. And here I have to point out, it's not going to me who's going to talk about it, but there are people that are involved, they have their place of speech to do so and they are engaged they are discussing how shall we address it of course it's also not easy because you have many ideas around and some some are very contradictory but the point is that is the effort we are making uh, we also have a very interesting but very hard 
circuit to build, and that is cultural diversity. And here we want to talk about the first inhabitants from Brazil, which of course we are not the Portuguese, and to talk about their culture. And again, we are working with them, how they want to be represented in our museum. And here I, I must say, Ben, that we already were doing that. We were doing that before the fire. Our anthropologists are working with them for decades now, which, to my surprise, after the tragedy, those original inhabitants from Brazil, they came to us and they say, we want to be represented in your museum. And it's wonderful and why they do that. Because, you know, colonialism, there's external, but there's also some internal one, as we, as we all know. And they only do that because we are already working with them. The third circuit is pretty straightforward. It's a history of life uh, and origin of life and the universe. So here's, for example, where we can receive lots of donations from different countries of biodiversity, of fossils, of minerals, and, and, and so on. And lastly, which I think is one of the really challenging one and, and which will, will also absorb the greatest part of the museum, and that is a Brazilian environment, where we can discuss biodiversity. And essentially the idea is a big journey in Brazil, starting at the palace, going to all the places in Brazil and returning to the palace. And by doing that, by showing how different environments are, but not only the plants and the animals, but also the interaction of the people. How did it come this way? A little bit about the past. We can also make parallels with other places in the world. You mentioned earlier on that it's an election year and it's very difficult, therefore, to talk about certain aspects of Brazilian culture in, in such a momentous moment. However... You talk about the environment there. The perception that I have, I'm not an expert in Brazil at all, but my perception is that Bolsonaro has been terrible for the environment in Brazil. And therefore, would you expect to run into difficulties should you have environmental programs if he were to win the election? To what extent do you expect to run into trouble with the kind of ideas you're talking about, about diversity, about inviting indigenous communities into the museum and so on, from government, or to what extent do you think you will be able to remain independent and to develop those programs without interference? That's very interesting to point out, Ben, because actually we at the museum, although we do have a lot of complaints, we want things faster, we want more money, we want you know more that things go 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 on in, in a higher tempo, but we are on the right path. With this government or with a new government, there's one thing I can assure everyone. The project of the reconstruction of the Museo Nacional is a winning one. Even with all those difficulties, with the difficulties that has been in the newspapers regarding about different perception of culture, with the war, with the pandemic, we are doing it. It's happening. You know, this is, I would love to have you here on September 2nd so you could see it for yourself. You know, and, and I can tell you whatever I want, but once you see things, you say, oh, well, you know, something is going on there, you know. So this is the point. The reconstruction of the museum, regardless of the government that goes in, is a winning one. And we will show what needs to be shown. Your enthusiasm is palpable as I'm speaking to you. It's really exciting to see how enthusiastic you are about the project. But I want you to cast your mind back to the 2nd of September 2018. And there was a fire six months into your directorship, which destroyed this extraordinary building and millions of objects. Was there any part of you at that point that thought, I just want to go back to dinosaurs, I want to go back to this pioneering work you'd done in paleontology? Or did your commitment that we're all hearing now, was that unwavering? Ben, I'm not a hero. <laughs> I'm not that kind of person. You know, and the only reason why I'm here is because there are so many of the anonymous that are helping, that are doing very hard work. I don't want to only play my work, but just very briefly, people like me don't run museums. If you look at my academic achievements, I'm someone, you know, in my small bubble, I reached the top. I'm a member of the Brazilian Academy of Science, TWIS, a research associate of the American Museum of Natural History, of IVPP in China, and so on and so forth. I got even the, the, the Grand Cruz, which is uh, the, the cross of honor from, you know, there, there are not that many people that get that. But this was the, the other side of it. In 2017, some people approached me and said, what are you doing for the museum? 
And I said, well, I'm doing my research. I hear I'm talking and giving talks of the importance. And we need to, you know, to rebuild them. We need to, to, to avoid that tragedy happens, blah, blah, blah. And I said, uh-uh, Mr. Kellner, it's your turn. Not only of science lives a scientist. And those people, I'm condensing it, they said, if you do it, we are going to help you. And I'm Ben, I'm not in this guy, oh, yeah, let's go. No, I, I'm the planning guy. I, I'm a chess player. Uh, let's see, movement here, why I'm going to do it, the advantages and disadvantages. And I talk with my, with my sons. I have two sons, which are much smarter than their dad. They are lawyers. And one is a judge, a judge in Sao Paulo, you know, so, man, you get the picture. And they said, don't do it, Dad. It's too risky. Just don't do it. Anyway, I told them that if people that can make the difference don't take the institution, nothing's going to change. And of course, now I have to pay for my big mouth. Now I have to pay for that because my career, Ben, is down the drain. <laughs> and, and believe me, I treasure my career. I really, I have even the first, the first receipt of becoming a member of the Brazilian Paleontological Society, the first receipt of becoming a member of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology in America. So I really treasure it. I have, you know, anyway. The point here being is that there's also a liberating part of this. The liberating part is that academically, I have nothing more to lose. I will go inside the history as the museum of the museum that caught fire. That's it. And, you know, and I don't say that to people who feel sorry for me. You don't need to do that. You know? This has really no much meaning for me. But it's also liberating. Because since I have nothing more to lose, as I say to everyone, as long as I have my health and as long as they let me, I'm going to work for the reconstruction of the museum, even if I have to twist some arms. And believe me, Ben, I'm twisting several. Well, Alexander, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Okay, very good. You can read more about the fire at the National Museum and its recovery at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for Android or iOS, which you can download from Google Play or the App Store. Coming up, we hear about Joshua Reynolds' £50 million portrait of Omai oh and about Michael Heiser's city. But first, here's this week's news bulletin. A magistrate's court in Yekaterinburg, Russia, ruled this week that a security guard at the city's Yeltsin Centre, who in December doodled eyes on a 1930s painting by avant-garde artist Anna Leporskaya, was guilty of vandalism and must serve 180 hours of compulsory labour and undergo psychiatric evaluation. Moscow State Tretchikov Gallery, which had loaned the painting, reportedly worth 75 million rubles or about $1.2 million to the Yeltsin Centre, refused to petition for charges to be dropped against the guard, 64-year-old Alexander Vasiliev, despite the death of his wife, the murder of his son and the fact that he was a veteran of the Afghan and Chechen wars. Two years after New York Attorney General Letitia James first accused the auction house Sotheby's of helping top-tier collectors avoid paying New York City and state sales tax, James's office claims to have evidence that the alleged tax fraud scheme extended to a greater number of clients. The original suit accused Sotheby's of handing out tax exemption documents called resale certificates to help elite clients avoid paying taxes on their art purchases. The certificates are intended to be used by art dealers who in turn sell the work to collectors, not to be used by collectors themselves. The Attorney General's office is now asking Sotheby's to hand over information related to more than 50 collectors who may have been given the documents. As I record this, Sotheby's has not yet responded to the art newspaper's request for comment. Several public museums and universities in Germany have become embroiled in criminal investigations into the widespread trafficking of Middle Eastern antiquities. In recent years, the investigations have prompted the seizure of a gold sarcophagus and five other works from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and the indictment of seven dealers, collectors and curators in Paris, including Jean-Luc Martinez, the former president of the Musée du Louvre. Among the revelations in Vincent Noss's report are that the Hamburg dealer Serop Simonian, who's the subject of a European arrest, Rest warrant had sheltered his stock in several German museums for decades. You can find Vincent's full long read report and more on all these stories on the website or the app. We'll be back after this. 
The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Founded in 1766, Christie's is a world-leading art and luxury business, renowned and trusted for its expert live and online auctions, as well as its bespoke private sales. Christie's offers a full portfolio of global services to its clients, including art appraisal, art financing and education. Experience Christie's private sales, a seamless service for buying and selling art, jewellery and watches outside of the auction calendar, working exclusively with Christie's specialists at a client's individual pace. Browse, bid, discover and join Christie's for the best of art and luxury at christie's.com or by downloading Christie's apps. Welcome back. Now, the art newspaper this week revealed that the National Portrait Gallery in London will try to raise £50 million to buy Joshua Reynolds' portrait of Omai, made around 1776. But this is not the first time that there's been an attempt to bring the painting into a British national collection. Tate tried and failed to buy the work 20 years ago. To tell us more about this recent history and the National Portrait Gallery's ambitious bid, I spoke to our London correspondent, Martin Bailey, who broke the story. Martin, before we talk about the latest news on it, I just wanted to talk a bit about the painting. Tell us about it. It's a major work by Reynolds. It is. I mean, it's a very large and impressive work. Very impressive. And it depicts a Tahitian called Mai, who we normally call Omai in the UK, um, who is a Polynesian who uh, met Captain Cook on his voyage in 1773. And Captain Cook encouraged Omai to come back to England, so he did, and he became quite a celebrity on his visit to London. And he then went back to uh, Tahiti and died a few years later. Now, when he was in London and a celebrity, he was portrayed by Joshua Reynolds, who was the greatest portraitist of the time. And it's a very dominating picture of Omai wearing robes. And it's one of the really great British portraits. And we should say, actually, that there was a letter to the FT sent by a host of important curators, writers, etc., which stressed how important this picture was as a representation of a crucial figure in the whole story of empire and so on uh, recently when this picture was up for export review. Yes, it's important for a number of reasons. It's First of all, it's a great artwork. Secondly, it's by Reynolds. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, it's got this fascinating link uh, with the South Seas. And it tells a bit about um, colonial history. It was a French colony later, but it's still an important sort of document, if you like, about European exploration and often exploitation of the Pacific area. And of course, because it was Reynolds who was then one of, if not the most famous artist of his time in London, and it was shown at the Royal Academy in the Great Summer Exhibition of that year, 1776, it, it, was, it was famous in its own age, wasn't it? It, it was, yes. It, it then stayed um, in an aristocrat's family for 200 years and then came onto the market. Yeah, well, tell us about that, because it was at Castle Howard, and obviously, therefore, hugely well-known amongst British art specialists of that period. Everybody knew there was this absolutely great Reynolds in private hands, and then it came onto the market. Tell us what happened then. Well, it was 2001. uh, The family needed a bit of money, and there were discussions about selling it to the Tate for about £5 million, but those discussions... Uh, weren't successful. The painting was therefore offered at Sotheby's um, in 2001, where it fetched just over £10 million. And at that point, it was bought by an Irish collector, John Magnier, or it was bought by a dealer and sold to Magnier. And um, he kept it. um, He applied for an export licence. What is an export licence, just before we go any further? The UK export licence system for artworks means that when an important work comes up for export, it can be deferred or delayed to enable a UK museum to match the price. And the price at auction was just over £10 million, but by the time an export licence was applied for, the price had risen slightly to £12.5 million. And at this point, the Tate decided it was such an important picture that they should make every effort to acquire it and raise the money. And they were extremely fortunate in that one private donor, who has still remained anonymous, offered to put up all of the money which was effectively buying Omai for the nation. So Tate went to the owner and said, 
Here's a cheque for £12.5 million. But the owner refused it and didn't want to sell. And that meant that the export licence was refused and he had to keep the painting in the UK. It was right. And so effectively it was just left in storage for a number of years after that, right? It did. I think it was in Christie's store um, in London. Um, So no one was actually enjoying it. Right. There was a brief loan to Tate, this sort of celebrated moment where there was an exhibition called The the Creation of Celebrity at, at Tate Britain in, around 2005, where at last it arrived in Tate, but very swiftly, of course, when yes, the exhibition it, ended, went back. Yes, it was it was at Tate for a few months during a very important uh, Reynolds exhibition, and uh, that was the only opportunity we've had to see it. Right. So we haven't heard about Oh My for a number of years now, but now it's back. Tell us what's happened. Well, this year, a new export licence application was made. And in March, uh, UK museums were given another opportunity to buy the picture. But by this time, the price had risen to an astronomical £50 million. I wanted to ask about the £50 million. Why on earth (laughs) has it gone up so much so we've gone from 12.5 million in 2001 to 50 million now what accounts for that i believe there are expert advisors who set that price but do you know what the logical explanation for it is well because of the high price and because of the rise um two outside experts were asked to give a valuation and they have confirmed that the 50 million pounds is right uh, one of the experts is anthony mold a uh, uh, london dealer now it may seem a lot but art prices have risen enormously and particularly for the top works and i think there's probably more interest in the sort of pacific angle of the painting now than there may have been 20 years ago And it may seem a lot of money, but I am not surprised at the price tag. And it may seem a lot now. In 10 years' time, it will probably seem cheap. Right. So effectively, you're saying that the historical importance of the work has grown because of the development of debates around colonialism, etc. So it's become an even more important painting than it was in 2001 when it was a great work by Reynolds and, of course, those issues related to it. But now it's become almost a, a much more political object somehow. Yes, and it is also a painting by a big-name artist and that always helps enormously. And, um, you know, we've seen very expensive paintings uh, selling for 50, 100 million pounds. So that's just the way the market goes. So 50 million pounds then. Is the Tate coming back in? Uh, No, it's not. I mean, that might be a bit of a surprise. The art newspaper asked the various potential London uh, and UK galleries who might be interested. And they obviously included the Tate Uh, The National Gallery would be an obvious home as well. And uh, because of the Captain Cook angle, Royal Museum's Greenwich or even the Captain Cook Memorial Museum in Yorkshire would be interested. But in the end, um, it's come down to the National Portrait Gallery. It's a very ambitious project for them. But I'm glad that someone's taking it on. Right. So just as a background, do you know, would museums have kind of discussions off the record about this? Would, you know, Nick Cullinan from the National Portrait Gallery say to Maria Belshaw at the Tate, look, I think we're going to go for Oh My, would you mind staying away from it? I'm sure there were informal discussions um, at director level, absolutely sure. But I think it's not so much asking people to stay away, um, because one possibility would be to cooperate and for two museums to buy jointly. And this happened, interestingly enough, with two Titian paintings, which also had price tags of £50 million on them. And they were bought jointly by the National Gallery in London and the National Gallery of Scotland. And that has some advantages, joint purchases, because each gallery or museum may have access to um, special funds of of their own. Um, So in a way, it's a little bit surprising that this idea of joint purchase hasn't gone on further. Right. And of course, Joshua Reynolds will be delighted to know that his his work's being valued at the same price as some, as some of the greatest paintings by Titian. But that's another story. The National Portrait Gallery raising 50 million. It's just had a big capital campaign to raise funds for its extension to the museum. How's it going to do it? 
Well, it is certainly going to be a big challenge. Uh, I mean, there are two obvious sources that you go to first. One is the Art Fund, which is a UK charity which raises funds um, for museum acquisitions. And the other is the National Heritage Memorial Fund, which gets government money. Now, 50 million, they could only provide a, a drop in the ocean. I'm sure that the National Portrait Gallery has been in touch with possible private donors and charitable trusts. And I believe those discussions have been going quite well. So there's, uh, they would certainly need a large amount of private money. The other unknown is whether the government might come in with a special treasury grant. And this is most unusual. It hasn't happened for decades. But it is something which is, is a possibility, although, of course, uh, the economy is in a very difficult situation now. Exactly. Um, I mean, I was wondering about that from on two counts, yeah. actually. The cost of living crisis that we have in the UK at the moment. On the one hand, it would seem certain that there wouldn't be a public campaign to raise funds from members of the public because of that, because it might seem tone deaf to the situation people find themselves in. And then, as you say... Is a government going to stump up millions of pounds when people are struggling to heat their houses and and eat? Well, I I would disagree with you about the public campaign. Uh, I I don't think you really can ask for private money if you're not actually going to the public and asking them to put £5 in the collecting boxes. So I suspect that probably will happen, although Uh I, I, I I don't know. And organisations like the Art Fund and National Heritage Memorial Fund also want to see the public doing their bit to contribute. Yes, of course, it's going to be very difficult uh, with regard to government money. On the other hand, this is a very long-term project in the sense that the painting will remain in a museum indefinitely. So it's actually being provided for future generations. And some people may feel differently about contributing something that will help their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Well, let's hope so. Let's hope at last Oh My finds its way into one of our national collections. Martin, thank you very much. Thank you. You can read more about Portrait of Oh My on the website and the app. And finally, it's time for Work of the Week. City, a vast complex of outdoor structures and land masses that the land artist Michael Heiser began constructing in the desert of Nevada in 1970, will finally begin welcoming public visitors from today, 2nd of September. The site's opening, more than 50 years after work began, marks the fulfilment of Heiser's career-defining project, which, at more than a mile and a half long and half a mile wide, may be the world's largest contemporary artwork. Our editor in the Americas, Ben Sutton, spoke to Cara van der Weeg, a senior director at Gagosian Gallery and a member of the board of the Triple Ort Foundation, which manages and preserves Heiser's work on its site, about the work. Can you tell me how you became involved with City and the Triple Ort Foundation? I work for Larry Gagosian, Gagosian Gallery. I'm a senior director there. And we started working with Michael Heiser at the end of 2013, And I first visited the city project, which is also where Michael was living at the time at his ranch in 2014. So that was my first time to see the sculpture, but I was really just involved with Michael's art, talking about his work, selling his work, putting together shows with him, and over time learned a lot more about city. And there was no shortage of work to be done, (laughs) and I was happy Mm -hmm. to do it. And um, so in 2018, I think it was, I joined the board of the Triple Ot Foundation, which is the foundation that owns and manages the city project going forward. Yeah. And so you just mentioned going out to the ranch and the site for the first time in 2014. I'd love to get a sense from you of sort of what it looked like then and and how much has changed since, obviously, enormously, I I suspect. And then also what what that experience is like of, of visiting the site and how it kind of reveals itself to you as you arrive. It's amazing. It's unlike any landscape I have ever been in. It's unlike any artwork that I've ever seen. You drive out to the project, or the visitors will be driven out to the project, through several valleys, about an hour and 15 minutes from any paved road or cell phone service. And you have this experience as you're driving of moving through this Western landscape that's like something out of a John Wayne movie. I mean, it's completely natural. There are antelope, there are free-range cows grazing, 
rabbits, that sort of thing. And it's a nothingness. And if you live on the East Coast, as I do, it's very rare that you have that experience of seeing just nature with absolutely no view of anything else, including wires, including telephone poles, including cell phone towers, nothing at all. Right. So the first time I went out there, I went with a colleague of mine from the gallery and we arrived, we were taken out to go and meet Michael, who, as I recall, was taking down a um, some kind of equipment. I think it was an antenna or something. And he had to drive it through the city project and put it in the equipment yard. So he was on this giant crane. Hmm. And he said, come on, get on the front of the crane. So we were on the outside of the crane. He's in the inside cab as he's driving across the city project. That's the first time I saw it was on the front of a crane with this dangling metal armature, which in retrospect probably wasn't very safe. But my God, it was fun. And it's incredible. It's bigger than you imagine even from the photographs because it can't be captured photographically. And it unfolds as you walk through it and as you experience it. And you really are meant to see it walking, to see it at eye level, but also at the human pace, not on a vehicle. So it was such a discovery for me, even though I had seen pictures, even though I had read the New York Times articles and, and others, it was my own experience and I really remember that time of being really moved. And, and it's a very solitary experience when you're in the project. You're typically alone, and you should. That's Michael's intention is that you have this kind of alone experience. There is mm-hmm. no sound, very little sound, because there's no ambient noise from traffic or from airplanes. There's one flight a day. There's sometimes Air Force flies overhead. Mm. There's a lot of nature, so you hear birds and you hear the gravel under your feet and you might hear the wind, and that's it. So it becomes almost meditative Mm -hmm. as you're walking, and your mind can wander, and you start to see these these shapes unfold in front of you, their mounds, their depressions, the perfectness of them, the way that he screened the gravel so that everything is a certain size, if it's three-eighths inch, if it's whatever it is, and it's all... So harmonious. That's why when you see the photographs, the the mounds and the depressions are all the same color. I mean, the rock is all taken from that valley, but it's it's screened so that everything is the same. And the sameness of it, the attention to detail, the crispness of the line, which are really concrete curbs that he pours on site, all of that, it blew my mind that somebody could have that attention to detail, that precision, and that that could exist in the middle of nowhere, that you come out of this vast valley and you see, as you turn a corner, you see the tip of something and you see some trees that are his ranch and you drive down a very long driveway and then eventually you come into the project and there you are and it's it's there, but <laughs> you have no hint of it until you're inside of it. Wow, that sounds incredible. You hinted at this solitary and contemplative experience of it. I'm curious sort of how, like when prompted by someone who maybe is not familiar with contemporary art, sort of like how you try to sort of explain that experience or or what what you liken it to. Like, you know, for instance, in the press materials, when, when the opening was announced, there were references to, you know, to structures like... Mesoamerican cities and and Egyptian temples and you know th- these kind of like ancient reference points and I guess is there something that you liken it to you know is there something that you kind of use as a point of comparison you know, what does it what can you approximate it to <laughs> well I, I've not been to Tetuacan and I've not been to Egypt regrettably not yet but <laughs> for me one of the reference points is a built city and it's almost as if you're in an abandoned city and I lived at City for five months during the pandemic, during the beginning of the pandemic. And so I would see these photographs of vast urban spaces that had no people in them. And then I was, I would Mm. go for a run (laughs) in City. And it was, I mean, to me, I kind of imagined that. And it's, it's a sculpture that I think is able to straddle time. So you feel simultaneously that you're in the past, the present, and the future. Hmm. To me, it also feels very futuristic. One critic referenced the movie Dune and and the original drawings for Dune, and I think there's also that kind of a landscape or like a lunar landscape. Again, it's really unlike any other topography 
that I've seen, but at the same time, it's geometric form, which we all know. And what I think is terrific about the city project is that anybody can experience it. Anybody can have a reaction to it. Everybody has a unique reaction to it. And that's not only okay, that's intended by Michael Heiser. He talks about how he's had truck drivers who've come out to make deliveries at his ranch and they've said, do you mind if I drive through that thing or walk through that thing? And he says, sure. And they go out and they come back and they have tears in their eyes. And it's, I mean, you don't have to know something about contemporary art. You don't have to read pages of text in order to understand it. It's feeling, it's being human. It's being surrounded by natural forms. Well, I guess speaking of the future, you know, obviously creating City was was a huge endeavor, first sort of taken on solitarily by Michael, but then also uh, under the auspices of the Triple Lot Foundation. And now going forward, obviously maintaining it is going to be a huge endeavor, I imagine. I mean, obviously the desert um, is a somewhat more static landscape than others, but even so, this nearly $30 million initial endowment to support uh, kind of the ongoing maintenance and operation of the site. I wanted to get a sense from you, since, since you're so involved in the foundation, what the biggest challenges are, what the biggest sort of logistical constraints and considerations are mm-hmm. for maintaining city to Michael's standards kind of going forward. Well... The environment is a challenge, particularly the rainfall in recent years has been, and the heat has also been very punishing, but they are challenges that we have thought through. And there was several years ago, we got a grant from the Mellon Foundation, which was instrumental in us beginning to think about conservation of the project. And so there was a very big study that was done to think about each of the elements, what needs to be done to conserve them. That was the beginning. We are very lucky that the people who are managing the project on a day-to-day basis at the site in Nevada have worked alongside Michael for many years, and they know they have built alongside him. They know how to build and how to rebuild these elements, the mounds, the depressions, and they still are constantly in contact with him if there's an issue. And so he's teaching them. They're learning, and they're recording what they're learning. I would be remiss if I did not mention, Michael's very proud of the <laughs> GPS system that he has throughout the project, which connects to the loaders and the graders that they use to create the mounds and the depressions. And they <laughs> are calibrated to a fraction of an inch so that the person running that machine knows how high off of the ground the gravel is supposed to be positioned, what the slope is. So it means that elements will not shift over time when the work is done. We've also surveyed the project many times and will continue to do so. Mm -hmm. But it's all to say we've thought it out and we are constantly thinking it out more and planning for the future. Mm -hmm. Of course, nobody can see into a crystal ball and say what the next environmental challenge will be. So that's the unknown. But again, I think we're well positioned for the future, I hope. I mean, I guess in the past decade or so, there have been a couple of occasions where there has been concern about the kind of long-term preservation and isolation and conservation of the landscape around city. I believe it was Senator Reed at one point had introduced a bill to enshrine that protection. There was, you know, a pretty public campaign by many members of the of the foundation and, and, and others to to get the site kind of permanent protection. I'm curious, are there still issues in that vein that are of concern to the foundation? Are there, I mean, I don't, I don't know exactly what it would be, but I would imagine things like solar power plants or mineral extraction or other, are there any other outside human factors, I guess? We are very fortunate in that in 2015, the federal government declared the land around and under city, it's 700,000 acres, a national monument. And what that did was that protected all of that land, which also holds terrific natural features as well as petroglyphs. There's a lot in that area. It made all of that land protected so that they can't do any further building, mining, There's still grazing of animals in areas. There's still hunting. There's still hiking allowed, but it's, it is all protected happily. So that is, is not something that we need to be concerned about. And the federal government is a great partner of ours in that respect. But, you know, now, now that the site is about to open up to the public for the first time, I'm curious how, how Michael and the foundation are thinking about 
um, access and programming, especially given the amount of attention the news of its opening has gotten. I wonder if there is, for instance, concern about like sort of meeting demand and overcrowding and how many or how few people to allow access to the site. And, and then also, you know, are there plans once there are people on site to kind of accompany them in any way, or is it hands off aesthetic experience? I mean, first and foremost, Michael Heiser is our guide. So we're following his directive as the artist. And what he believes is most effective is that there are only small groups of people who are ever in the project at one time. It is a mile and a half long by a half mile wide. So the intention is that there are six people at a time who are permitted on the project, which means that most likely there's nobody else who you can see within any kind of a sight line, or if so, maybe one other person. Mm -hmm. And that is our plan. In that way, you have the experience that he wants you to have, this this one-on-one -on -one experience with the sculpture. We are deeply flattered and thrilled by all the attention for the project. And we recognize that it will take time for everybody to be able to come and see the project. But hey, it's been you know 52 years in formation. It certainly <laughs> will be around for another 52 years. So they've right. got time. I, <laughs> um, I beg patience. Also, I hope in the future there will be eventually a book on the city project. Gagosian is working on it with Michael Heiser. And so there will be illustrations. People can see that book. They can read more about the project and, and have the experience not of being there, but at least of learning more about the sculpture. And eventually through our website, we hope to have a more enriched experience with information about the history and hopefully more photographs. Over time, we will build that up. I've often thought of City as kind of like this sort of crowning achievement of, of Michael Heiser's mm -hmm. career. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious from your sense, you know, does this feel like an end point or do you think that he's sort of taking something from this process that it will kind of reflect in, in future work? So much of the work that I've seen of his lately, like his most recent show at, at Kagosian on, on 21st Street there, you know, was this kind of almost confrontation with the enormity of of nature mm -hmm. in a way and and city seems to me again having not been like something more about kind of humanity's inherent instincts or foibles or image of itself in the world and i guess i'm just curious sort of if you if you think this is an end point in his career and no, definitely no. not <laughs> i mean he <laughs> no way he's you know he is an artist and artists create until the day they can't and mm -hmm. I think City is within Michael's own career, the past, the present, and the future. It's a language. It's a language he's used again and again and which he will continue to use, and that's nature, and that's geometric form, and that he's working with size, and your perception of size, and your perception of an object as you move around it. But I think, mm -hmm. you, so you saw that in the Gagosian show, you see that in City, and you might see it knock wood in, in, in another <laughs> in another sculpture in another couple of months. Sure, you know, uh, no, I, I think that it's a massive, massive achievement, but it's not the end. Great, yeah, Good. glad to hear. It. <laughs> Kara, thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much. If you want to visit City, you can email info at tripleortfoundation.org. That's triple A-U-G-H-T foundation.org to request a reservation. And you can read more about City on the website and the app. And that's it for this episode. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Amy Dawson, Henrietta Bentel and David Clack. And David also does the editing and sound design. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to our guests, Alexander, Martin, Ben and Cara. And thank you for listening. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.